We've been studying discipleship from the Great Commission. It's been challenging. It's been invigorating. A lot of discussion last week about the church. One person said uh, to partner with the Holy Spirit would mean that we pursue righteousness without being self-righteous, and that we have compassion without being permissive of sin. Nice balance. There was another great poem put up there, and uh, a question to me, which I, I answered. It's all in the response on the front page of the website. We need to do something so we can have a discussion going. I'll work on that. Uh, this week, we dive into the real meat of discipleship, so let me read the text for you one more time. It's from Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that little section we're going to be talking about today is about teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. A disciple is a learner. In fact, student would be an accurate translation. But here we come face to face with one of the major challenges in the Western church. We looked at the word disciple several weeks ago, and you might recall that in the Greek culture, disciples were often associated with philosophy. Disciples attempted to emulate a, a teacher's uh, understanding or thinking. And it's that Greek model that has influenced most all the education that you and I have ever had. Um, we study to learn ideas. We're students to learn ideas. Uh, that's certainly true in the church. From Sunday school to sermons, when we think of learning, we think about learning more ideas. And instructing the mind is a fundamental part of discipleship. But when Jesus called disciples, and when he calls us to make disciples, he had more of the Jewish discipleship model in mind. And remember, disciples of Jewish rabbis lived with their master. Lived with their master. And Jesus called disciples who, who were willing to live with him, which is still true today, because we're always his disciples. Of course, uh, he couldn't say, come live with me. He was traveling. He'd say, follow me. Same thing. Come live with me. Disciples lived with their masters because New Testament discipleship was more than learning to think. It was that, but it was learning to live. The goal of a rabbinic disciple developed, uh, uh, was to develop not only just the same ideas that a rabbi taught, but also the same character of the rabbi, the same qualities of home life, so they would be in the home, the same work ethic, the same approach to charity and to civic involvement and everything else. So disciples of Jesus then and now are not just called to learn ideas from him, but they are called to learn from him life. Learn to live like Jesus. If Jesus had in mind what we mean by going to school, he would have said, teaching them everything I have commanded you. That's not what he said, is it? He said, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And there's actually two separate Greek words there, so it's making that point, teaching to obey. The idea, uh, ideas, are, ideas are absolutely fundamental, but Jesus didn't command us just to learn ideas. He commanded us to learn a way of living. Now, I found examples of various apprenticeships to use as illustrations, because at least in apprenticeship, you're doing something, right? But the problem is it's hard to find a modern illustration of a full-fledged discipleship that molds an entire life and not just teaches a skill, for example. To have life-molding discipleship, I had to go to the movies, okay? Because Jedi disciples did not just learn how to fence and do somersaults in the air. They were supposed to learn an entire way of life. It's amazing to me that Obi-Wan did that in about 10 minutes of dialogue, but still, a way of thinking, a way of acting, a way of being. And the point is that while we do indeed need to think like Jesus and talk like Jesus, discipleship ultimately is about living like him, which is, includes that and, and more. So what does it mean? What does it mean to live like Jesus? Does it mean wearing robes and sandals? Wandering about homeless? Acting like a man? Finding hills to preach on? What is it? 
The way we live like Jesus is to obey everything he commanded. This is what he said he meant by it. Jesus understood his own life in terms of obedience. Obedience to his Father's will and commands. That's how Jesus and his humanity understood being human. He came down from heaven to obey his Father. That's why he was alive as a human being. That's why he was to do the will of his Father. Doing God's will was his food. It was what energized him. It's what nourished his soul. It kept him alive. And as the cross approached, the one thing, in fact, the only thing that made him go through with it was obedience to his Father. Because what else would a human being created by God live for? A disciple of Jesus has decided, has decided that their ambition in life is to emulate him and his obedience to God. Or to put it another way, their, their purpose in life is to obey Christ. People who only enjoy listening to his teaching, they're always welcome, but they are not yet his disciples. Disciples love this man whom they believe to be divine. And they have bound themselves to him as their master, not to mindlessly imitate him, but to have their minds renewed with a new understanding so that life can begin to mean what God meant for it to mean. So the Great Commission implies we need to look at discipleship from two angles. First, what does Jesus command? And secondly, then, what does it mean to learn obedience to it? We find God's commands all over the Bible. The tree of life, our conscience, the Ten Commandments, God's covenant, Israel's ceremonial laws, civil laws, Old Testament stories, poems, proverbs, the example of Jesus himself, and all the instruction of the apostles. In different ways, all of these things reflect God's character. Collectively, we call all of this God's law. And since they reflect God's character, they instruct us about what it means to live in God's image, which was why he made us in the first place, to be in his image. But where do you start? It looks so complicated. And God's word is so rich. It has such a wide variety of human personalities and human history and human literature it takes years to review and absorb all this well Jesus commands make it all very simple okay he condensed he summarized he didn't replace but he combined all of these ideas into one idea love he said that the entire Old Testament could be summarized by just two commands Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor, at, and who is everybody else, as yourself. Jesus called these the greatest commandments. And the Apostle Paul explicitly teaches us that love is a summary of all God's moral law. It doesn't replace it. It's a summary of what it is. And then Jesus added one, he called it a new command. He said, a new command I give you, and that is to love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. His disciples, he's talking about now, Christians we would say, must love each other as he loved them. He loved us by giving us his life. So this is all that Jesus commanded, and therefore what his disciples are committed to learn. Love God above all. Make God's will and good pleasure the most important thing in your life. Above anything else you desire or anyone else desires. Acknowledge God as the center of the universe and therefore the center of your universe. Love your neighbor as yourself. Treat every human being as you wish you were treated. Main themes he, he's talked about, to be kind, to be fair, and to forgive. You do that for anyone and everyone. 
God did not create any of us to be the center of the universe. That position is taken. So we have no more importance and no more rights than any other human being. Or to turn it around, other human beings have whatever importance or rights that we think we have. And we must treat them accordingly. Love fellow believers as Christ loved you. Now that goes beyond loving them as neighbors. Of course, it includes all of that. Kindness, fairness, forgiveness. But other believers share the same Heavenly Father as you. They share the same eternity as you. They share the same spiritual family. So you are called to sacrificially spend your life for their benefit, just as Jesus spent his life for your benefit. Sacrificing for one another is part of what it means to be in his fellowship. Here it is. It's everything Jesus commanded summarizes the rest of the Bible. It's simple. A child can understand this. Now, as we try to live according to these simple aspirations, all kinds of questions arise, right? How do we put God first in this situation? What is the fair thing to do? How should I spend myself right now for his people effectively? Dozens, hundreds, thousands of questions over a lifetime. Well, that's where all the other stuff in the Bible comes in, okay? Jesus commands, summarize the whole Bible. And that means that the rest of the Bible expands and explains Jesus' commands to love. And so we explore love by studying all the Bible, every bit of it. We gain ever-deepening levels of clarity and wisdom about Christ's command to love. Lots of principles, commandments, warnings, examples, positive and negative. Lessons from history, lessons from poetry. The Bible gives us a lifetime's work of unpacking what love is. Practically, realistically, and in every kind of situation that we will encounter. But it never has to get complicated. If we keep focusing on Jesus' summary, put God first ever and always. Treat others kindly, fairly, and with forgiveness. Spend yourself for God's people the way Christ did. His commands keep things simple. Of course, as soon as I say that, I remember something I read with one of the elders a couple weeks ago. It was a, it was a quote from Ted Williams. Ted Williams had the highest batting average of anybody who, who hit over 500 home runs. And uh, once uh, a person came up to him kind of snarky and said, uh, you know, all you have to do for a living is just to hit a ball. <laughs> That's pretty simple. And Williams said, yes, yes, it is. It is simple. But it's not easy. Okay. Simple, but it's not easy. It'd be challenging enough just to learn what it means to love in every situation, but that's not our goal as disciples. Our goal as disciples is not just to learn about Jesus' commands, it's to obey his commands. Learning to obey Christ's commands involves more than study. What it involves is practice. Practice, constantly trying to love over and over again. You don't get it right the first time, but the Holy Spirit's with you as a great instructor. You just keep practicing and practicing and practicing. My mother told me that if I didn't practice my piano, I'd never learn how to play it. And she was right. <laughs> but while I, I never learned to play the piano, I have practiced uh, loving for about four and a half decades. And I got, you know, the more you do it, the more you realize how, how far you have to go. But you do learn something. So when, you, when do you practice obeying Christ's commands to love God, your neighbor, and the church? When do you do that? There's a couple of ways to answer that. So let's look at both of them. On the one hand, a very good time to practice loving is during the major trials of your life. Don't usually think of it, but that's when it's a great time to practice loving like Christ. Okay? The word translated trial in the New Testament could equally well be translated test. Challenges test us. And we need tests to help us know how much we've learned. It's easy to love when love doesn't cost much. When love is expensive, then you discover your skill level and your commitment level. Challenges bring pressure, they bring tension, and they bring pain. That's why they're called challenges, trials. 
In those situations, we naturally want a good outcome for ourselves. We want a good outcome for those we love. We want release from pain, relief from pain. Those are natural desires, not a thing wrong with them. But a disciple has committed himself or herself to something higher than their own natural desires. He's committed himself to put God's honor and glory and good pleasure above any other personal desire. She has committed herself to treat every other human being as just as important as she. And disciples have committed themselves to spend their lives on their spiritual family, even when they themselves are under pressure and suffering pain. Isn't that what Christ did? Disciples who can do those things when their own lives hurt, when they're under pressure, when they themselves experience loss, are learning to love like Jesus, because that's what he did. So one way to think about it is, best time to practice love is when life is hard. But there's another way to think about it, too. And that's to remember what a discipleship initially meant. It meant living with the master, learning to emulate life as it happens. And that would focus mainly on the small things, on the easy things. Because that's what happens most and most repetitively. So the point is we can practice love all the time. Don't have to be in a trial. You can practice love all the time in absolutely everything that we do. How can I put God first right now? By the way, it doesn't have to be a rhetorical question. You can ask that right now. How can I put God first right now? You can ask that all the time. How, how must I treat the person that I'm with right now in terms of kindness and, and, and fairness and forgiveness? How could I spend myself for my Christian fellowship at this point in its uh, existence? All these things, not when they're hard, but when they're easy. And therefore, when I'm most tempted to be thoughtlessly selfish, but also when I have fewest distractions, if I do want to practice on loving. So two ways to practice love. When life is hard and when life is easy. Either way, you become a mature, effective disciple the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. There are a couple of things we would do well to include in our practice. One is to combine our practice with Bible study and prayer. The more Bible you know, the better you understand what Jesus meant by love. The more you pray, the more you interact with the Holy Spirit about life, and he can explain what you've learned in the Scriptures. Let your study and your prayer move you to practice loving. When you learn something when you, with your mind, try to practice it on somebody as soon as you possibly can. Practice it on God by putting him first consciously through some decision or practice it on somebody else by treating them the way you want to be treated or, or spending yourself for the brethren. When we learn something, we need to try to practice it right away because if we don't, we tend to file it away with the illusion that we've actually learned it. Of course, we don't learn love until we do love. And keep in mind that it works the other way too. When you're trying to practice love and you're having trouble, let that drive you to the Bible and prayer. In other words, your growth points are not just whatever the pastor decides to preach on. Your challenges to love may involve something entirely different than uh, these sermons. So don't only apply it to the things that you are taught Endeavor to learn what love means for the challenges that you actually face. And that means crafting your own study. If you need help, ask a pastor, somebody that, uh, that knows more for guidance. Uh, it means praying diligently about what you need to do. So pair up practice and Bible study. It kind of goes both ways. And one more thing, along with all of that, pair up practicing with discussion. Talk to fellow believers about what you're learning and how you want to grow. I don't think that we actually grow in anything we don't talk about. I know that's not a hard and fast rule, but it's pretty close. We don't grow in anything we don't talk about. Why? Because for most people, and it certainly is true for me, hypocrisy is just too tempting. If I don't expose my growth points, I'll probably ignore them. 
hide them. It's not a matter of revealing dirty laundry. It's a matter of sharing personal aspirations. I want to talk. I need to talk about how I want to love better. Right now, there's a person that I'm finding very, very hard to love. It's hard for me to understand how to love, and it's harder to do what I already know. Now, I've shared my, you, you know what I'm talking about because you've been there, and I've been there many times too. And I've shared my desire to love this person with Mickey and with a few people, a few brothers that uh, I can trust with it. And because I've shared it, I can't pretend now that it's not a problem for me. I've got to deal with it. Okay? Don't think it's one of you. It's not one of you. Just don't, don't, don't. That's not, that's not, no. And now that I have shared it, they can help me. Okay? They can give me ideas from the Bible that had not occurred to me because I don't know what I don't know. And they'll see things I just don't, haven't seen. They'll lift, they lift up prayers for me that God will answer. And they will help me be accountable to God just by asking me how I'm doing. And as I learn to love this person, which I'm going to do, because God answers prayer, uh, be, they're going to be encouraged that if God could help me love in this way, maybe God can help them love in that way. Discipleship is learning to love like Jesus. If you're a disciple of Jesus, this is what you signed up for. Not just a life of Bible reading and listening to lectures only, but a lifetime of learning to love like him, putting God first always, treating everyone else truly well, and giving yourself for the people Christ died for. That's what God made us for. Christ is going to redeem us so we get there. Discipleship requires lots of conscious practice, loving God and others, lots of Bible study and prayer to work out Jesus' simple commands, and lots of sharing, discussion, encouragement to help us get free from our self-obsessed sin and learn to love. Question for the week. Two parts. We'll take the one side of trials. How are you being challenged right now? How are you being challenged right now? What will you do to love like Jesus? It's practice. How are you being challenged? What are you going to do to love like Jesus? And to do that, you're going to have to start praying. You're going to have to look at the scriptures. You're going to have to do this with the Holy Spirit's help. If you'd like to share your experience, either by name or anonymously, or if this has stimulated a question or a thought, leave a line or two online. You get there on the first page of the website. It'll be good for others if you do. Might be good for you too. Let's get ready to come to his table. Let's pray. Lord God, your son's table has always been a kind of a favorite place. It's, um, it's here that we think most concretely of his love for us. It's demonstrated in his broken body and his shed blood. It's here that we rejoice in sins forgiven and guilt cleansed, fellowship with you forever restored. Today, though, as we remember the Lord's Supper, we think of the Last Supper when he instituted it and how he used it as a teaching time, a time to stimulate the practice of love. We talked a lot about love then. We remember how he explained lordship in terms of service, washing feet as an illustration. I believe that's when he added his new command to the other two. So, Father, as we come as disciples to this table, we come seeking cleansing and we come seeking fresh forgiveness. We come seeking understanding and encouragement. But we also come with holy aspiration to obey your commands. Not to earn anything from you. You've given us everything you've got. But as disciples, that's why we're here. We look at how your son loves you, Father. We look at how he loved every person he ever met. And we look at how he redemptively spent himself for those who belong to you. And we want to be like him. We just want to be like him. We want to obey all the love he commanded. So, Father, win us afresh with your holy heart and your deep love 
and lift us up again as your son becomes our vision. I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it. He broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And after supper, he took the cup. <clears throat> he said, this is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. We're told as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. So I invite you to come to his table.